Disclaimer. We are interested in everything and experts in nothing. We enjoy learning, but get it wrong sometimes. We mean no disrespect, and if we mess up, kindly correct us. Let's take this ride together, unless your intention is to cause harm or distress. In which case, with utmost haste, fuck right off. What are we doing this week? I am doing the Irish potato famine. Oh, okay, good, yes. good. Yes, so the Irish potato famine, also known as the Great Hunger, began in 1845 when a fungus-like organism called Phytotrophora infestans, or P. infestans, because I do not want to try to say that shit again. But you did a good job. I I might have I might have fucked it up. Like well, it there's gonna be good. like some biologists that are like, that is not the pronunciation. You know what you and sold I it. apologize. <laughs> um, but this spread th- rapidly throughout Ireland. The infestation ruined up to one half of the potato crop that year and about three quarters of the crop over the next seven years. It's a long time. It is a long time. What the hell do they mean a fungus like organism. organism? Like I didn't look too far into it, but I'm guessing it's A mixture between a bacterium and a fungus? I'm not sure. Because I I assume that it's, like, not a fungus, like you're thinking of a mushroom growing out of your potato. Yeah. It's something that's straight up destroying the crop. Yeah. So, I don't know. I should have looked further into it, but again, I didn't even want to say the name. (laughs) So, I was not going to try to fuck around with the... uh, my microbiology you did not want to fuck around and find out i did not want to fuck around and find out with that's microbiology fair. that's fair because that's how plagues start <laughs> okay okay so this was the thing for me like before i continue on i was always as a uneducated small child thinking why didn't they eat things other than potatoes like why was this such a big deal we're gonna get into that okay and it's it's kind of fucked up Oh. And imperialism ruins the day. Oh. So it's not the greatest okay. story, but I was just All kind right. of like, okay, I thought it was a stereotype that Irish people like lived off of potatoes. No, no, it's not. Okay. And there was a reason and an unfair one. Okay. So um, the tenant farmers of Ireland, then ruled as a colony of Great Britain, mm-hmm. here we go with the imperialism, relied heavily on the potato as a source food. The infestation had catastrophic impact on Ireland and its population. Before it ended in 1852, the potato famine resulted in the death of roughly 1 million Irish from starvation and related causes. How many, you probably don't know, but how many Irish were living in Ireland in 1845 slash whatever? I do think I have that answer further down. Okay. I'm not sure though, and if, if anything, we can do a Google pause. Okay. Um, but there were at least another million forced to leave their homeland as refugees. Mm-hmm. That's when a lot of them came to America, a right? A lot of them came to America because yeah. of the famine. So, oh, backing up a little bit. Uh oh. So, no, sorry. I just had Bono in my head. The when the Irish were on the run from starvation and yes. a British government that couldn't care less. That is exactly what happened. Yeah. They. Yes. Going into that, thank yeah. you, thank you, Bono, for <laughs> thank that. Thank you, intro, Bono, for that musical interlude that we didn't sing because we don't own the rights to that. Um, Ireland in the 1800s, with the ratification of the Acts of the Union in 1801, Ireland was effectively governed as a colony of Great Britain until its War of Independence in the early 20th century. Oh, okay. So together, the combined no- nations were known as the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland. So smush it all together. Okay. Um, As such, the British government appointed Ireland's executive heads of state, known respectively as the Lord Lieutenant and Chief Secretary of Ireland. Although residents of the Emerald Isle could elect representatives to the Parliament in London, they still picked who was in Ireland. So the Mm. Irish could elect who they would have in in the um, Parliament. Parliament. But Britain still appointed the Lord Lieutenant and the Chief Secretary. So they didn't get to choose their... Their local government. Kind of like their their 
their president, their per president, se, but they can yeah. choose their senators. Kind of, yes. Okay, all right. Um, it's a little, yeah, but basically the local person, they did not get to pick. The person off in parliament who they never interacted with on a daily basis. Yeah. That they could send that guy. Okay. Who's going to get ignored. You know he is. No yeah. matter what he says, he's going to get overruled. So it's just basically a ceremonial position at this point. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, in all, Ireland sent 105 representatives to the House of Commons, the lower House of Parliament, and 28 peers, titled landowners, to the House of Lords or the upper half. Um, the upper house, excuse me. Mm, okay. Still, it's important to note that the bulk of these elective representatives were landowners of British origin and or their sons. So they're going to be loyal to Britain before right. they're loyal to Ireland. Yeah. In and addition, yours? any Irish who practiced Catholicism, the majority of Ireland's native population at the time, were initially prohibited from owning or leasing land. Voting or holding elected office under these so-called Penal laws. <sighs> yeah. Although the penal laws were largely repealed in 1829, their impact on Ireland's society and government was still being felt at the time of the potato famine's onset. Yeah, that makes sense. Yes. So English and Anglo-Irish families owned most of the land, and most Irish Catholics were regulated to work as tenant farmers, forced to pay rent to the landowners. Ironically, less than a hundred years before the famine's onset, the potato was introduced to Ireland by the land gentry. Wait, so they never had potatoes like a hundred years before the famine? They never even had them in the first place? Basically, yes. Wow. However, despite the fact that only one variety of the potato was grown in the country, this was called the so-called Irish lumper, it soon became a staple food of the poor, particularly during the cold winter months. Mm -hmm. So a hundred years before this happened, they didn't even have, like, native potatoes. Hmm. It was brought. Yeah. So here's um, a picture of, this is the Irish lumper. We can meet the Irish lumper. It just looks, looks like, like an Idaho potato. <laughs> yeah. It looks like a potato. Yeah. If you lived in Ireland in the mid-19th century, there is a good chance you would have eaten almost nothing except this delicious little tuber. I mean... Maybe it's my Irish heritage coming out, I man. Potatoes. I love potatoes. I, love I could potatoes. eat them all day, every day. I could have potatoes at every meal, literally. And yes. I would be happy. Yes. But okay. if it was only potatoes. I mean, I still don't know. When we were in Rome, mm -hmm. well, first of all, Athens had really good French fries, that which was blowing our minds. Kaylee and I were like, why does this French fry <laughs> taste so damn good? And, like, it was still good when it was cold. Like, mm. it was so potato-y. It was delicious. So we thought that was good, right. right? Then you get to Rome. Then I got to Rome, and I had, like, these roasted potatoes with my meal. Uh-huh. And they were making fun of me because I was getting, like, I had an emotional reaction <laughs> to this potato. <laughs> you had a religious experience with it, potatoes in Rome. <laughs> there was no reason for that potato to taste that good. What did they do to it? It was so good. <laughs> so, all right. I don't know. I, I think I could. I could eat potatoes you every meal, I think, and I would yeah. be happy. I don't know if I could survive without cheese, though. Oh, well, yeah, you got to have cheese with them. That's fair. Yeah, if you couldn't dress them up at all, it might be a problem. Yeah. Yeah. So... <sighs> anyway, <laughs> at the time, about half of Ireland relied on potatoes to survive. Although farmers planted different varieties, the lumper was fi by far the most popular because it grew well in poor conditions. Oh yeah. So this was the hardiest little lumper. Good job, good lumper. job, little lumper. In 1845, 24 percent of all Irish tenement farmers were on 0.4 to two hec hect acres, which is one to five acres oh, in thanks. size. While 40% were on two to six hectares, which I don't like that word. Hectacre? Acre. Hectacre. Hectacre, which is five to 15 acres. That sounds like a good amount. It does. Um, but holdings were so small that no crop other than potatoes would suffice to feed a family. Mm. Shortly before the famine, British government reported that poverty was so widespread that one-third of all Irish small holdings could not support the tenement families after rent was paid. Oh, wow. Yeah. The family survived only by earnings as a, secret, as a seasonal migrant labor in England and in Scotland. 
So they had to leave and get seasonal work to pay when it wasn't harvest time. I feel like maybe rent was too high. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Okay. Um, following the famine, reforms were implemented, making it illegal to further divide land holdings. I guess, well, because if they were so small, they, they couldn't were so support small, them they, anyway, yeah. then making them smaller, smaller would, would just be. create more problems? Yeah. Okay, I think I follow that. Yeah. Yeah. In 1843, the British government considered that the land question in Ireland was the root or foundational cause of disaffection in the country, or the fact that you're taxing the living fuck out of them. Yeah. Just a thought. Just a thought. Can't be that, because then, you know, they right. would have to change something. Right, I know. It can't be the fact that we're imperialistic bullies, but... Nope. <sighs> They established a royal commission, chaired by the Earl of Devon, to inquire into the laws regarding the occupation of the land. Daniel O'Connell described this commission as perfectly one-sided, being composed of landlords with no tenant representation. That's, oh, God. Okay. Yep. I don't know why I'm surprised. Like, I, uh, I should have seen that coming. <laughs> I should have seen it coming. It still doesn't make it any better. It's not better. No. In February 1845, Devon reported, it would be impossible adequately to describe the privations which they, the Irish laborer and his family, habitually and silently endure. In many districts, their only food is the potato, their only beverage, water. Their cabins are seldom protection against the weather. A bed or a blanket is a rare luxury and nearly in all their pig and manure heap constitute their only property. Wow. Yeah. Holy crap. Right. Here's a picture, dude, of what a Irish tenement farm was like. That's awful. Right? That's like straight up, like, poverty. That's, That's just, awful. That is the definition of poverty. Yeah. Okay, so here we go. In 1841, census showed a population of just over 8 million. Okay, so 8 million people oops, total, mm -hmm. 1 million died, right? So 1 yep. over 8, it's 12.5%. Yeah, and then the other, at least another million forced to leave. So 2 million have either perished or fled. That's a quarter of the population. Yeah. 25%. Mm -hmm. That's insane. Yes. Wow, okay. It's a lot worse than I ever thought. Yeah, that's huge. And I didn't understand the systemic imperialistic yeah. thumb that was pushing these people into the ground. Yeah. Well, it would be hard to understand that as a kid. As yeah. a kid, yeah. Wow. Yeah. In let's see. Um, in 1841, we had that census of over eight million. Two thirds of the people depended on agriculture for their survival, but rarely received a working wage. Shocking. I know. They had to work for their landlords in return for the patch of land that they needed to grow enough food for their own families. This was the system that forced Ireland's peasantry into monoculture, since only the potato could be grown in sufficient quantity to meet nutritional needs. See, this, this is why we need diversity. Biodiversity, diversification in your stocks. Relying well, they, on one thing is a terrible plan. Well, the problem is, is not they couldn't. They didn't have the room. They no, didn't I understand have the room that. To diversify, and it it came down to yeah, we could maybe get four beans, or we could get forty potatoes, and there's eight of us to feed. Yeah, no, I completely understand how it happened and why they made the choice they made. But, but yes, someone. You can see that precipice about to fall over the cliff of doom. It's yeah, coming. it's coming. There's just. It's, it's a bad idea. It's a very bad idea. Ugh. And we're going to get into why. <laughs> yeah. Um, when the crop began to fall, I'm sorry, when the crop began to fail in 1845 as a result of the P. infestans infection, Irish leaders in Dublin petitioned Queen Victoria and Parliament to act. And initially they did, repealing these so-called corn laws and their tariffs on grain, which made food such as corn and bread prohibitively expensive. Wow. Which is why, yeah, they were growing grain. Yeah, they were growing wheat. But they made it so expensive, it was essentially all being grown and sent back to England. Yeah. In or which case, only... what's the benefit to them to do that? There's no benefit. Yeah. Still, these changes failed to offset the growing problem of the potato blight. With many tenant farmers unable to produce sufficient food for their own consumption, and the costs of other supplies was rising. Supplies? Supplies. Supplies. Supplies rising. 
thousands died from starvation and hundreds of Jesus. thousands more from the disease caused by malnutrition. Yeah. So, not a great day. Or series of days. Not a great seven years. Not a great series of horrible events. Complicating matters further, historians have concluded that Ireland continued to export large quantities of food primarily to Great Britain during the blight. Here we go again. Mm -hmm. Large quantities of food that could feed all of these people who are dying of malnutrition and starvation are being sent back to Britain. Why? Because the British rule. Oh, for fuck's sake. The British are in charge. Okay, look. I gotta say... If you're relying on these people in order to supply your own pockets, mm -hmm. does it not make sense to you that those people need to exist in order to do that? Have you met the British monarchy and imperialistic? <laughs> I mean, do you strictly what speaking, in India and Africa and no, but strictly they didn't speaking, care. no, I've never met them. Never met them personally, <laughs> but historically, oh, do Lord. you have a flag? Is very much their go-to. <laughs> okay, Eddie. <laughs> <laughs> um, so. During the blight, in cases such as livestock and butter, research suggests that the exports may have actually increased during the potato famine. So, this is just fucked up. They're starving, and yet you're still demanding livestock, butter, wheat, corn, all of the things that could fix this in a year, maybe? Yeah. You're making them ship off. Yeah. And what are they going to do? They're tenement farmers. They don't own the land. The selfishness and greed are just infuriating. Yeah. It's infuriating. Um, in 1847 alone, records indicate that commodities such as peas, beans, rabbits, fish, and honey continue to be exported from Ireland, even as the great hunger ravaged the countryside. The potato crops didn't fully recover until 1852. And by that was then... seven years. Yep. And by then, the damage was done. Although estimates vary, it's believed as many as one million Irish men, women, and children perished during the famine, and another one million emigrated from the islands to escape poverty and starvation, many landing in various cities throughout North America and Great Britain. Mm -hmm. So, we know they lost a lot of people because imperialism sucks. Definitely. So, the last part of this I have in the legacy of the potato famine. The exact role of the British government in the potato famine and its aftermath, whether it ignored the plight of Ireland's poor out of malice, or its collective inaction and inadequate response, could be attributed to incompetence, is still being debated. Okay, I'm leaning towards just greed I'm and the, lack I'm of empathy. I'm leaning towards all of it. I'm leaning but... towards malice, and basically, if we ignore it, it'll eventually go away. Um, however, the significance of the potato famine, or in the Irish language, I'm sorry for anyone who speaks Gaelic, and Gorta Moor. Oh, yeah. Looks like a good guess to me. Yeah, that's what I'm guessing. In Irish history and its contribution to the Irish dysphoria of the 19th and 20th centuries is beyond a doubt. Yeah. Uh, Tony Blair, during his time as the British Prime Minister, issued a statement in 1997 offering a formal apology to Ireland for the UK government's handling of the crisis at the time. Because an apology <sighs> from Tony Blair is what they needed. I mean, okay, better late than never, but, but I'm like, yes and? Yes and? <laughs> like, <laughs> now what? Now what? <laughs> I mean, well, obviously, by that time, Ireland had... I don't, what, what is it? It's not seceded, but they had gained their independence from British rule. Yeah. But still, again, too little, too late. Yeah, like, Jesus, thanks, I guess, thanks, better I than guess. never, but I... yes, and? <laughs> what yes, am I and. supposed to do with that? Right? <laughs> One thing I did read that was actually really beautiful um, was during the potato famine, I believe it was the Iroquois tribe, mm. um, like, sent over like five or ten gold pieces, which for them was like everything. That's a lot. It, it was a lot. So there's actually a statue in Dublin in honor of that tribe who sent, um, tried to send help. And then I love that. when the virus, the corona issue was affecting a lot of indigenous reservations and they weren't able to get food and aid because they were 
Huh. Conveniently being ignored. Of course they were. Yep. Ireland sent them aid <gasps> as kind of like a, you, you guys helped us. When we were in crisis, we want to help you. I love that. Right? I love that. Yeah. But that is what I have for the great hunger. Wow. Yeah. That was way bigger than I thought it was. Yes. Like, I mean, I... I like you said, I've heard about, about it. <laughs> like, I've heard about the Great Famine. Yeah. Everybody's heard about the Great Famine, yes. I think. But a lot of people who have Irish roots, their family came over because of. Yeah. They came over directly because there was no food. Yeah. I think mine came before that, though, honestly. At least according to, like, the ancestry chart, like, all of my ancestry was here in the 1700s, I think. I'm mostly Polish. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm like I'm like 75% British Isles, yeah. so UK Wales. Right. Like Scotland, Scotland Ireland. Ireland. Um and then like 20% German and 5% fill in the blank. Yes. <laughs> it's, a, it's a mix. It's a miscellaneous um, mix. But yeah, when they do like little maps, like all of my ancestors were in Kentucky by like the 1700s. It was <laughs> Kentucky. Choctaw. It was the Choctaw tribe. Oh, the Choctaw? Yeah, there's the there's a picture oh, of the statue. Oh, that is pretty. Isn't that beautiful? Oh, yeah. Put that on the website. I'm gonna. That is gorgeous. Yeah, I love um, that. In 1847, they had um, they took up and collected over five thousand dollars in today's money. Yeah. To support the Irish during the potato famine, and so in 1995, they got they erupted er, er, erected this sculpture as a thank you. It's beautiful. It's and, really pretty. Yeah, it is really beautiful. And, you know, and the Choctaw in 1845 weren't doing that great. So, well, let's be real. What they indigenous people well, did going do this. well <laughs> once, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> once America got here. <laughs> I know. It's true. Uh, uh, that's dark. But, okay. Yeah. All right. Well, I guess it makes it my turn. So, if you enjoyed the podcast... <laughs> Give us a like, share, subscribe on any platform. Um, you can find us on social media. We are on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube at Our Trivial Obsessions. We are on Twitter at Our Trivial Pod. We have a website, www.OurTrivialObsessions.com. That's where you're going to find all of our references and episode bonus materials. Mm-hmm. Um, you can email us at RandomQueensObsess at gmail.com. Random. Because we are. Queens. Because we are. Obsessed. Because, because we, we do. do. Email us there with anything you want to add to the conversation or any suggestions for a future topic. Um, and that is that. We're done. So Bye. we'll see you next week. Bye. Bye.